All right, you're great. Cool. Um, yeah, so my name's Kyle Jackson. Uh, I'm the member coordinator for the Hawaii Ulu Co-op. And um, a little bit about my journey in ag in Hawaii. Uh, I graduated from UH with a degree in plant science and tropical horticulture. Um, I worked for the USDA and for CTAR for a couple years. Uh, after I graduated school doing crop loss insurance for farmers. Um, so kind of going out and visiting farmers and assessing their crops and making sure that um, the stuff that they're growing is insured and they get a payment if there's like a hurricane or a drought event or something like that. Um, I've been working with the co-op for the past two years now uh, and it's been really, really fun. I get to come out and interface with the public and I get to support our farmers and I get to learn a lot about breadfruit and about natural farming and agroforestry. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a combination of agroforestry and cooperative business structures. So you guys are uh, a nonprofit, which is a similar but different, you know, arrangement. So we're actually uh, a member-owned cooperative, and we currently have about 140 members in the co-op. Uh, we started off with less than 10 members. We had about six members when we first started. Um, and that was back in 2016, and it was a small group of growers who just recognized that Ulu had a big bottleneck when it came to a few different things, but mostly marketing and processing and being able to sell Ulu. Um, and that was because of a few reasons. Uh, one is that you know the culture is not really present for people to consume Ulu on a mass scale. We've transitioned to other you know, uh, mainland western starches like potatoes and rice and all these other things. And um, breadfruit's almost been like looked down upon as a food, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. It's like, ah, oh, that's like poor people food, or ah, oh, that's it's not enjoyable to cook or to eat. Um, and so these farmers also saw that when the breadfruit tree fruits, you can get a few hundred pounds at a time. And trying to take that to, you know, Sunday market or sell it to Island Naturals, is really challenging because it'll go bad in two days. You know, it has a two to three day shelf life if it's not refrigerated. Um, so these farmers decided to get together and create, you know, their own markets and their own processing facilities and their own business structure. And this is um, a little poster we made after our six years, and a bunch of this stuff is on these on these posters too. You guys can check out um, as we talk in. Um, so we've got two commercial food hub facilities on this island. Um, one is in Hilo, one is in Kona. We ship all of our stuff on the east side to the Hilo one, and then we transfer it over to Kona where we process and get it ready for distribution. Um, we've got about 21 full-time jobs working for about 150 farmers now, um, which I started about two years ago and we had about 90 farmers. So we're, we're really growing in our capacity to support members and also for, you know, people to be interested in growing breadfruit. You know, we've seen a really big resurgence in that, especially in the last few years. Um, this was made a little while ago, so we have a little bit more um, co-op members than that. And we've got about 6,000 plus trees in the co-op now, um, and a little bit over half of those are still in the tree. So the potential for harvesting breadfruit on the island is still like really huge, and our supply to demand ratio is pretty crazy. Um, you know, I don't see us being able to satisfy the local markets for a really long time, uh, mostly because we work with outlets like the DOE, um, food box programs, and, and other things to just get, you know, these programs um, have massive outlets for folks. And so uh, we try to work with as many local groups as we can. Um, we've got 350 unique customers. You can find our stuff at most grocery stores like Long's and Island Naturals and KTA. Um, you might even be able to find them at, at some of the other providers. And I think a few of these places are on Oahu. Um, we're in local restaurants like Cafe Pesto. Uh, you can find our stuff at Locavore Store in Hilo, which is one of my favorite places to shop um, for good local food. And um, so yeah, a little bit about the co-op and how we got founded. Um, the mission was originally to revitalize Ulu as 
you know, something that was viable for farmers economically, something that's viable for the community as far as a staple crop that we can easily rely on. Um, and the vision is really just uh, a thriving business structure that, you know, actually gives dividends back to farmers who are growing local food instead of making it, um, making it really challenging for farmers to profit, you know, and having multiple steps in the value chain. Um, so we're kind of taking that straight out. We buy straight from farmers and we sell straight to the customers. So that vertical integration is really challenging when you're talking about bureaucracy and uh, business structure, infrastructure, all that kind of thing. But once it gets set up, you know, um, it can be really profitable in the long run. And a few of our values, uh, Malama Aina, Malama Kanaka, Ike Maui, O'Oulu, Alo Ahe Alo, and Pupukahi I Holomua. Um, these are all centered around focusing on the land as a part of the community and focusing on the community as a part of the land. And recognizing that farmers are, you know, some of the most important <laughs> stewards of both our community and our land because they grow our food and they interact with the Aina in such an intense way. Um, so it's really cool to work for the co-op because, you know, um, coming up in ag here, I feel like a lot of people really have passion and want to do, do something good, but it's hard to find, it can be hard to find a job in ag that, that feels aligned with that and not extractive or, um, or something of that nature. So. Yeah, really stoked to be working for the co-op. Um, okay, so we've got a few folks that know about Ulu here, it sounds like. Um, you guys live on the other property that has Ulu as well? Yeah, I live next to a old Ulu stand. It's pretty awesome. Nice. There's like 40 trees back there. And they're like old heritage trees? Yeah. Uh, yeah, not old, yeah. Older than me, probably? Yeah, for sure. They're yeah. at least... Uh, 70s, 70s, before pre 70s. Is that sound possible? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Down, down here? Well, the age of the hour, the hour, and the school, or something. Well, that's very old. Cool. But, um, what would you date those in? Mm -hmm. and sell your ulu locally? We definitely harvest. Yeah. A lot of it ends up being um, prepared by Sean here. I harvest pretty much all of it. All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we eat all of it. Yeah, yeah. we like <laughs> so 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 Ulu ice cream, yeah, ulu fries, ulu potatoes. Third, third year, we get around, I want to say it's like 300 pounds. Nice. Some more. That's my quick guess. That's, yeah. I mean, that's uh, so we probably way. sell, I don't know, 20. Pounds to eat the rest. Yeah, you just sell it in your shop here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Well, it's I'm all for communities eating their Hulu directly. You know? <laughs> uh, but if you guys ever have extra, we will buy it for you. You know, if you ever have like 50 pounds or 100 pounds, we get a crazy eating season. Um, you can actually sell to the co op as non members. So you don't have to apply, you don't have to do anything. You should call us if you like, want to come in two hours and bring you a bunch of Hulu. Uh, for non-members, I believe it's a dollar a pound for A grade, uh, and 75 cents a pound for B grade, and I think I have some of that in this presentation. So I was going to say, like, what distinguishes grade of Ulu, exactly. but you're going to get into it. Yes, <laughs> I think one of these posters might... Nope. You're great, we'll get there. Yes. Cool. <laughs> 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 oh wait, I didn't do that slide yet. Um, so yeah, if, if you guys are familiar with Lulu, I'm sure you are, you know, living here and, and living on the property that you live on. Um, but it was definitely one of the things that, you know, got Hawaii to where it is today, you know, between Lulu and Kalo and some of those other kiwi crops. Um, the ability for them to, to feed large populations was pretty astounding. Um, I don't think the Kona Ulu is that Okay. Um, so yeah, Kona side actually used to be one of the biggest breadfruit forests in all of the Hawaiian Islands and it was called Mala Kalo Ulu and it was, you know, twenty miles of a breadfruit based agroforestry system where they had 
uh, kalo and sweet potato and they incorporated animals and uh, it was a really bountiful system and unfortunately that forest is mostly gone. It's, you know, that section of Kona was very popular for coffee growing uh, and other large scale commercial farming. So you can see a lot. If you go in that little middle key A neighborhood in Kona, if you guys know where that's at, you'll notice a lot of ulu trees around. There. So there's still a pretty good natural population. And some of those trees, you know, like down here as well, can be, it can be really old, you know? Um, I, I don't really know what, the limits for survival is on on this island, but it can be a really long time. Because I've met uncles who I asked them how old their tree is, and they're like, "Oh, that thing was big when I was a kid." And I'm like, well, you're like seven. So how is that a 200 year old tree? Like, wow, it's pretty pretty impressive. And like you said, you know, how do you if it's one tree that started a whole forest? Like, is that the same tree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Theoretically, you know, thinking about it that way. So. Like Utah has the largest living organism, the longest living organism. That's a stand of aspen trees or poplar trees. Really? It's called one root system. It's a sort of one, one tree. Yeah. 10,000 years old. Yeah, so Ulu traditionally had a lot of uses. Uh, it wasn't just food, they used it um, to build their canoes, they used it for medicine, they used it for um, cloth and paper. They, they obviously ate it. Um, the, me the leaves and the sap and the bark and pretty much every part of the ulu tree was used for medicine in some form. Uh, and it's actually really easily Googleable. If you're interested in it, you can just Google like uh, medicinal uses of ulu and there's like a whole spreadsheet. And it's, it's pretty amazing that this, you know, um, one plant could do so much for, for these people, you know, it's like, feeding you, getting you out in the water and fishing and then taking care of medicine and other other functional needs of your body. So it's pretty awesome. And yeah, why Ulu? Um, I think, you know, it's pretty self-evident being on Big Island on White Ulu. You know, we import a huge amount of our food here and that food isn't the most nutritious. Um, the way that it gets here is not the most sustainable. And we saw during the pandemic how easily that system can be disrupted, you know. And we have the we have the luxury of living on an island where we have so much space and so much food growing in such a small population that you know if we really take advantage of it, then we can be very food secure. I think we are, you know. I think if it came down to it, we'd probably be okay. But we can always get better at it and be able to support neighbor islands or, or do something like that and we'll be able to get to that situation. Um, so yeah, another reason that I really like Ulu is it's a great cornerstone for agroforestry systems. Um, it, it can play a lot of different roles, you know, you can use, we'll talk about agroforestry a little bit later and some of the functional aspects of it, but you can use Ulu for pretty much any of the uh, uses of agroforestry, of the five main uses. Um, and it's nutritious, and it's productive, and it, it's got a really low maintenance requirement, you know, for the first few years, you really just have to weed it, fertilize it, make sure pigs don't eat it, and it'll take care of you for, you know, generations after that, so I consider that pretty low maintenance compared to other things like hollow or other fruit trees and stuff like that, so, yeah. I don't know if you guys would agree, if you do any of the maintenance on them, do you guys prune your trees over there, you just let them yeah, do their thing? Yeah, we've cut a few, but generally just wild jungle yeah. trees. Yeah. They're monsters on their own self-defense. Yes. They're great. And we planted <laughs> seven in the past air layer just for fun. Like oh, nice. Learning as we went. And the pigs nearly killed every one of them. There's a lot of quality around the meat and so mm -hmm. It's incredible how they'll still thrive, they'll produce fruit, even though like 90% turtle and some of these new trees are there. Yeah. Really resilient, you know. Um, I think. Yeah. Cover it a little. Um, so yeah, a couple health benefits of Ulu. You can also see some of this uh, related info over here on this poster. Um, it's got more dietary fiber than both brown and white rice. Um, it contains proteins and carbs. 
Uh, a half a cup of ulu is three times the beta carotene of one cup of carrots. And that seems like a funny, should be like six times. Uh, so, sorry, that's not kicking in. Uh, just, let me adjust this <laughs> And, you know, compared to potatoes and rice, um, it's, it's just so much more versatile in the ways that you can use it. Um, you can harvest it right, you can harvest it super, super mature. That's my favorite way, it's just like really custardy. Just like, eat it raw sometimes, you know? I'm like, I'm gonna cook this, let me just take a bite. I'm like, oh, that's good. Oh no. All right, let's give a couple things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really strong alternative, not just because of how productive the trees can be and how easy it is to take care of, but because it's actually better for you. Um, and making people understand that it tastes good too is part of the mission. <laughs> Um, so yeah, talking about agroforestry, um, I think a lot of the reasons that people lean towards agroforestry right now is food sovereignty. Uh, I think they have a really special lens being in Hawaii, uh, looking at that topic, you know, both for cultural reasons and for geographic reasons. You know, we're so isolated and uh, we, we do have a lot more resources here naturally, but we just have to learn how to use them. Um, and so yeah, this is kind of some of the stuff I just talked about. Uh, the closest port is 2,300 miles away. We import an estimated 90% of our food and like almost all of our staples, which is pretty crazy um, when you think about what we would do if that, if that wasn't available, you know? Um, at any given time, we have a five to seven day supply of food and our imports are very vulnerable to disruption, which, you know, you guys saw if you were here during COVID, she went to Island Naturals one day and there was like, no food? And you're like, oh, oh. And they're like, yeah, it'll, there'll be more in like three weeks. And you're like, okay, oh wow, this is, you know, it, it was a wake up call for me. And so a few things that Lulu could replace are rice, wheat, and potatoes. Uh, and also value-added products. You know, the co-op makes hummus, we make mousse, we make flour. Um, that's like one of the biggest replacement things I see because it's really easy to make it. You just have to dehydrate it and make a blend. Um, and you can use flour for so many things. You can make noodles, you can make pastries, you can bake bread, bread fruit. Um, so yes, I think Lulu and agroforestry combine really well when we're talking about it. And so it's cooperative business structures because you're not relying on external markets, external um, facilitators, packagers, anything like that. You know, once you have the vertical integration, like I'm sure you guys have aspects of that in what you do uh, as a nonprofit and with your store. And yeah, the more that you can do things in house, the more that really stays with you, stays with the farmer. We like that. Because it's hard enough farming as it is. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about site selection. Um, you can find this suitability map on our website. It's a pretty cool thing that um, some researchers put together on the potential uh, cultivation range for breadfruit in the islands. So, uh, we are so super. <laughs> yes. No, no, that's not good. Um, yeah, you guys, I, that's why I'm just gonna touch on this because I mean, we can see the ocean. Um, anytime you can see the ocean from where the breadfruit is located, you're doing it. You know, unless you're at 2,000 feet. Um, so yeah, the, the most important things when it comes to if you can grow ulu and how productive your ulu is going to be and whether you can do commercial production or you just need to focus on having a little bit of fruit for your family is uh, rainfall, temperature, and um, Soil pH and drainage also matter, but the two biggest ones are rainfall and temperature. So, for instance, you can be a little higher up on Kona side because they're going to get a little less rain. They're going to be a little warmer than me and Fern Forest. You can't go where I'm at. I'm at 2,300 feet. It's just too cold. It's too wet. Um, the trees have a hard time with disease. They have a hard time even growing to a mature size up there. Um, so we usually recommend folks below 1,500 feet on the east side, up to 1,800 feet on the west side, but that's really dependent on what your weather is like. And 
you've seen, you know, uh, depending on how long you guys have been in Hawaii, you've seen, you know, our, our weather changes in the past few years. So, uh, our rain is really not consistent seasonally to what it used to be. We used to have, you know, uh, expected periods where we knew it was going to rain and it was going to be pretty dry. And that really, really throws off the ulu. Um, they're still really resilient and they still produce a lot of food, but um, normally they get one or two big flushes in a year. We've been seeing three, sometimes four. Um, so that means you're going to get less fruit, maybe your fruit are going to be smaller. It takes more time and energy to harvest because you have to go out that many more weeks into the field, um, spend that time and money on labor. So. This is really cool. I, I recommend checking it out if you're ever um, just trying to nerd out on some new stuff. And then this is also a global map. Um, and they kind of are working on doing predictions for future changes in climate to see, okay, if these trends in temperature and uh, rainfall and stuff continue in certain areas, where might we be able to grow this food in the future within 10 or 20 years? Um, which is, I guess, one of the positive aspects of global warming, so we can grow great food in more places. Um, I think that's on that same blog if you guys want to check out. So yeah, I got a picture of a bunch of different varieties up here, so you can really see um, how physically different the, the varieties can be. Oh, and wow. I think a lot of people aren't aware of this. You know, most people are aware just of like one or two varieties, like Hawaiian and Mahabala. Those look pretty similar, even though they're usually different sizes. Um, but here you really get to see, um, you know, the difference in ripening between the different varieties and like that's where understanding ripening stages and when to harvest and um, knowing that for your variety is really important because, um, you know, for instance, this variety will get a lot more browning within the cells. And then we have other varieties uh, like this one and this one that will actually get the browning in the links in between the cells. Um, and so knowing what characteristics to look for for your hulu is really helpful. That one looks like a little ours, durian, ours look a lot like, like a little jackfruit. Upper left, and then down to like the that one and the lower right. Oh, okay. We have some trees, maybe two, that are like that green spiky one there. Really? On the left. Okay, that's cool. Where's that one? By Jungle Love. There's oh. two of them back there. Okay. Jungle Love? The tents that are like ah. Uh. <laughs> we're like there's like a mental map everyone's like where's that tree <laughs> um, cool yeah they I, I have a, a struggle with those to like know when they're ready they seem to not seem to always get it too late well not necessarily it's just yesterday it's mm -hmm. delicious and yummy. yeah but it's like that's the only way i can get those it seems they're hard to change for me this one yeah yeah that's that's a hard one <laughs> um i don't think that's cool that could be cool but i think and th those spikes are also way more pronounced than the ones that we have also. Really? Yeah, it's ours. You guys ours. might have a special variety, you never know. It's not quite that pronounced. There's a lot of um, it's unique for sure. VT down here in in Puna. I've noticed. There's a lot of VT and I've heard of a couple farmers in Kalapana between Kalapana and like the Uki area having some really old trees that are not Hawaiian, which is pretty uh, it's not what you find out here. You know, a lot of people have really old trees and they're almost always one. Maybe a mahapala here and there, but that's the most common variety. Those are generally smaller too, just kind of like this. Or size. Yeah, so oh, maybe you this. might have some mahapala, yeah. but that's also a characteristic of those bigger trees that aren't being managed. Sure. Yeah. You know, okay. they just kind of have yeah. a little too much energy output on vegetation. Got it. But I'd love to come check out your guys' Ulu. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we yeah. If you want to <laughs> follow this up, we can do a little yeah. walking tour if you want. Totally. Yeah, 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 that sounds great. Sure. I'm all about that. I mean, that's my favorite part of this job. Um, so yeah, talking a little bit more about varieties. Um, there are over 200 known varieties of Ulu. Um, there's not really a best variety. People will complain a little bit about Maafala because they tend to have smaller fruits. Whereas, you know, they can be more on average about this size. Whereas Hawaiians and Oteas and other varieties can get like soccer balls really big. Um, but that's really dependent on your microclimate, how you're managing it, if you've been on your maintenance since day one, or if you were kind of lackadaisical the first couple of years, because that can really affect future fruit growth. Um, 
And the seven most common varieties are up here. Uh, the two common ones in Hawaii that you see the most are Ulu Maui, uh, Otea, and Ma'afala. Um, the Ulu Maui and the Otea are the Hawaiian varieties, and the Ma'afala is a Samoan variety. Um, and that's that's one you'll see a lot more in Polynesia. You'll see a lot more uh, Ma'afala and Fiti and Puo. Um, my favorite is Otea. It's like the creamiest, it's like the, the yellowest, I think. Um, we've got a really cool varieties video uh, that you can find on our website, ulu.coop, and it shows you, um, I'm not sure if I have any of those slides up here. It shows you um, the growth pattern of all the trees, and then we take a ripe fruit from each of the trees and open it. So you get to see what the trees look like when they're growing and what the fruit looks like. Um, we did eat it, but we didn't do it after that, so that'll, that'll probably be like this summer or something. Um, and you can also buy trees on our website, so I know you guys don't have that problem. Uh, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, so a few years ago, uh, we planted in Hawaii. Yeah, we only saw them but then Ginger John, the other month, was saying don't plant them they shifted. What's wrong with the model? Well, that's why I was saying that you know some folks complain. Um, it really depends. First, it depends on your microclimate. Ma'afala or Hawaiian, they're they're going to do better in the places that they prefer, and you can't know that until you until you grow them. Uh, Ma'afalas will generally do a little bit better at higher elevation than the Hawaiians and some of the other ones because they have the smaller fruit and they have a more dense growing structure. Um, John is funny. You, was he speaking somewhere recently? Uh, I'm part of the farmers union, so oh, okay. I was at like the farmers union. Um, oh, he was griping about mom ball at the farmers union. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think he was just talking about like like the importance of like expanding varieties and he's like, don't everyone just go for this one? Like, you need to like have other varieties yes. on your property and kind of promoting more like genetic diversity in that way. Totally. So, Small great, but I think mainly focused on the biodiversity. But then, he even yes. said he only goes one variety of taro. Of all these years, he yeah, yeah, he, was <laughs> one he does the Palawan variety of taro. We're working with John to get source uh, a few different things for our agroforestry site that we are doing at Oakley Farm. Oh, okay. Um, so he gave us a bunch of that kalo. He gave us some cassava. Um, so yeah, we love John. Sweet. <laughs> um, so yeah, varietal diversity is a consideration, but once again, it's uh, it comes down to what your intentions are, how you want to harvest your crop, how you want to maintain your crop. Um, if you want more consistent maintenance, then just go with one variety, you know, because it's going to be different trimming a Hawaiian versus trimming a Mahapala. Um, if you want to harvest just once or twice during the year instead of maybe three or four times, because they do have slightly different fruiting periods. So if you plant, I would say it depends on how many trees you're doing. You know, John has a lot of trees. I don't remember off top of the number of his he's, he's got a lot. So if you're planting like three or four, or five or six, you could switch up the di you know the diversity all you want, and it's not gonna stress you out that much. But if you have a few hundred trees or something like that, and you've got four varieties, then you could be harvesting all your long. Um, and that that's cost prohibitive because you can't just hit it once. You know when it's when it's harvest time, as you guys know, you gotta come through like every couple of days or like once a week to make sure that you're you're hitting that right interval where it's not dropping, but you're not out there every day checking it. Mm -hmm. I like Otea. That's the one I push to people, and I think we have those for sale right now too. Ah, perfect. Um, we have these varieties for sale right now. <laughs> Um, you can find that info on our website, and um, there's also a few nurseries, like you guys said, planted, and a few other folks that do um, do these things. And we don't have a problem selling them. There's always a huge demand. Sometimes there's a wait list. Um, it doesn't say here, but I think we have a wait list on the Hawaiian and the Maoko, and we have the avail the Otea available from Tissue Culture. So that's kind of cool. Why the different prices? The different prices are because uh, the Otea came from tissue culture selection, so we ordered a big flat of those and then raised them up as cakey, whereas the air layer, we actually had to go out and do that. So, so labor costs? Yeah, a little more labor costs. Um, 
one's not necessarily like better to take than the other or we are still kind of in the beginning stages of that okay. Lulu doesn't have a lot of the tried and tested research as yeah. far as um like what other orchard crops have sure. you know yeah because uh, it's just kind of becoming something that the academic community is looking into and taking seriously um so a lot of what you know our research is and a lot of what the collaborators and collaborators that we work with is it's all pretty it's the first draft you know um, trying to make nutrient recommendations and trying to uh, assess best management practices and all of that kind of stuff we're, we're really just cracking the surface on that one yeah which is great because that means i'll have a job for <laughs> <laughs> <Job's here. laughs> i don't know so i'll be working on that yeah I don't think they probably won't figure it out in my lifetime, so. Um, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about agroforestry. Um, on our website, ulu.coop, you can find a lot of really, really cool resources that we've developed for agroforestry, for Hawaii farmers, tropical farmers in general, um, but specifically for ulu and Hawaii. Um, yes, diversification, benefits and challenges. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the times people talk about agroforestry and it almost enters like a greenwashing kind of space where it becomes such an uh, inspirational subject that they forget to leave, they forget to include the difficult parts of it so that it's, you're realistic about it, you know, because it's, it's actually not easy in conventional farming, right? I would say it's, I would say it's significantly more labor and time to do agroforestry. Um, but, the benefits are that you're not poisoning your land, not poisoning your community. Um, you can probably utilize a lot less resources in the long run. Um, and you get to avoid relying on mechanization and stuff like that, which is you know, a big part of how large-scale commercial orchards are. And not having that reliance benefits you in a lot of ways, especially being in a rural place like this. And maybe being a small farmer who can't afford a two hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment, which negates the whole cooperation. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of info on spacing and planting, and how to kind of get your site ready to plant ulu. Uh, we made an ulu primer on our website, and it goes through everything from site ID to getting them in the ground to maintenance to harvest, um, and that includes like you know making sure that you've got access to good sunlight, you've got access to water. You don't have access to water that you are able to bring some water in for the first few years because you really don't want those trees to struggle when they're taking. Um, and then you know proper amendments for getting them in the ground, proper maintenance and um, planting designs that incorporate other crops. So we kind of look here and we've got the overstory, the midstory, and the understory. So the blue can occupy you know the midstory and the overstory along with coconut and something like madre de, de cacao um, and then in the middle you can have things like papaya and bananas and other fruit crops and in your understory you can have lena, walla, palo um, and you know intentional design and planting is really the biggest benefit you can have as someone who wants to do agriculture because um, it's a lot harder to to go backwards or to try to change something when you're doing this intentional, intentional style. Yeah, making sure that your plants are safe. I'm sure you guys know uh, pigs down here are pretty gnarly. And they love ulu. They really <laughs> love ulu. Cows do too, actually. Cows will chomp a young ulu pretty good. They'll just take the top off of the thing. And it's, it's, you know, like you guys said, the trees will come back, but it's never fun to go out there and see your blue tree just like <laughs> watch you let this happen <laughs> um, so we recommend if you don't have fencing in your in your place to do like a six foot hog wire barrier with weed mat around the tree when you plant it and that's pretty foolproof and unless you have a really really stubborn pig they're not going to do that. Um, have you seen uh, Bunny Chicks uh, the roof stand that they created and it's tiered with banana yeah, and they have their mamaki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that? I, the last time I was at their place was probably like a year and a half ago, so I need to go back there. But when I was there, I really liked how they had their, their chicken tractor set up. You know, they were adding a lot of organic matter that way. Um, I think 
think they were having a little bit of an issue with how close their Mamaki was with the Guru. They didn't, they didn't anticipate how far the Guru was going to spread. And so that's one of those things of like really understanding your planting plan and like what things are going to look like in five or ten years. Because um, you're not going to be able to to just move on the Mamaki yet. You know, you're going to have to replant that whole thing. Mamaki is pretty sensitive. And also, you want to make sure that your Ulu trees aren't competing for root space, nutrition, um, any of that stuff. That's really important because they have pretty shallow root systems initially. Yes, so agroforestry techniques. Um, these are the five main techniques recognized by the USDA for agroforestry. So if you're applying for grants or you're doing things like that, you're kind of going to be looking through this lens. Um, and we've got videos actually on our website for each of these topics because uh, we have farmers that engage in a combination of or even just individual practices that are on here. Um, so alley cropping, pretty simple and something that we see uh, really common out here in Hawaii which is just rows of ulu with something else planted in between it. Um, you could do a rotating thing where you start off with palo or something else and then you transition to a shade loving crop like coffee or cacao when they get bigger. Um, and that's actually, you know, uh, not something that John does, but something that Tom does. Um, Hawaiian Hilo Crown Chocolate, if you guys have ever seen that shop. It's across from the bakery downtown uh, by where Lucy's used to be. He's one of our farmers that does cacao and coconuts. Uh, he's probably in this, um, in this slide deck a little bit later. So yeah, he does alley cropping with the cacao because it really likes the shape and it kind of acts like a wind bucket, the ulu rose. Um, and then you've got forest farming, multi-story cropping, which you guys are familiar with being down here in Kalapana. You know, it's ex exactly what your ulu stand is, right? It's a, it's a natural ulu-based agroforest, it sounds like. I don't know if there's other food crops there. No, I need to do food crop. But, um, yeah, it's, a, it's like a canoe plant forest stand. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, exactly like that. Um, you know, a system like this requires a little bit more upfront and continual labor than alley cropping, which is a little bit more towards like commercial orchard style because you still have those rows and it can come in and row. Whereas multi-story cropping, you're really trying to make it something that a vehicle or a machine can't really get through. You know, it's it's a whole integrated piece. Um, Riparian forest buffers, not something we see as much down here in Puna because we don't have a lot of open waterways. Um, but a forest buffer is going to be the installation of trees or shrubs against any type of waterway, especially one that has soil. It can help prevent erosion. It'll help leach out the nutrients. Um, if you have a lot of farmland up above the property or you're getting nutrients washed down from somewhere else, the Ulu can uptake that. And you probably even get some food out of it. So. Um, Silvo pasture, we see our cow friends here. Uh, definitely something that I recommend to farmers who are able to do it and have the time and energy uh, to manage animals. Or if they have a large enough property, um, leasing. Leasing out your pastures on a rotational schedule. Um, it helps to keep the weeds down and it adds a lot of bio matter to the soil and just like increases the stimulation of the land of the line. Uh, but dealing with animals is whole nother story. So I think, you know, that's that's a very selective thing in Hawaii, um, especially with Hulu because things like cows and goats and, and that you have to put extra protection in the orchard if you're going to look And then windbreaks, um, they can also act as, you know, hedged windbreak rows if you plant them closer together. If you go closer than that 25 foot spacing and just work on your pruning a little bit, they kind of make this big, really thick bush. Um, that can be a really awesome windbreak that also provides food. Um, and you can use any species for these. This is just um, examples using food. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about nutrient management. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, a lot of the stuff with Hulu is kind of on the frontier. We're still proofing out what we're finding. Um, so we're finding that uh, Ulu has a really high potassium, calcium, and magnesium requirement. 
Um, it's really fast growing and lightweight, but um, is really susceptible to over fertilizing with nitrogen. Uh, meaning that if you over, over fertilize with nitrogen, you'll get a lot of leafy growth, a lot of vegetative growth, and not as much fruit. Um, so it's important to pay attention to what you're feeding your tree when, because during the younger years, you can fertilize with a higher nitrogen supplement, but once it starts fruiting, you want to provide those other nutrients in a greater ratio. How's it going out there? It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And on our website, we actually have uh, a whole nutrient management guide, video, and a fertilizer calculator. So if you guys are ever interested in fertilizing those trees, like if you do a big pruning, you can go on the website and look up about how much fertilizer you should be putting on each tree. Um, what do you put like? What's what? Here? Oh, to do that just easier. Okay. Uh, what you're asking? What do we fertilize with? Yeah. Um, if you want to use conventional, we recommend we recommend ten five twenty. Um, and if you want to use organic, we recommend uh, Biopore six six five. And I think that's not on this screen, but um, these links in here are all on our website. So you can go uh -huh. to the nutrient management guide, and there's a video. You can also um, find our fertilizer calculator on there. So it'll, you can just type in the age of your tree, how much fruit you're getting off of it, and it'll tell you about how much fertilizer you need to replace that, that fruit that was grown. So those are really fun things that we're, we're trying to make for farmers, you know, because looking at research is, is not for everybody. So we try to make like, you know, tangible interactive things that anyone with any level of education can use. Uh, it's, that's a big focus for us. I think I'll skip this slide. Uh, we do have a lot of info on disease and pest management on our website also. We've got a uh, Hulu deficiency guide and uh, what's the other one? Uh, the disease guide. So you can kind of compare those two things if you're having issues with your Hulu trees and look at the nutrient deficiency guide and the disease guide and kind of say, all right, this looks like the disease that I have, and this might be the cause. Um, and Queensland longhorn beetle is, is definitely something that we're looking at right now. I don't know if you guys have this on the property here. I do some more of it. Really? Yeah. They're pretty large. That's awesome. They're big. They're big. They're big. Yeah. yeah. I've seen a lot of water. Yeah. They're, they're, they're down here. We have a few farmers um, off of Peaky Cow who've got some. Um, and they can be really bad. So if, if you guys see like a single one, trap that bugger and send it to the USDA. Because um, it's potentially like one of the worst pests that we might have to deal with in modern times because it attacks everything. Uh, it usually starts in Kukui. So it's it's best to keep your eye on Kukui trees, other native trees, other native hardwoods. Um, and once it spreads, it, it's not really discriminatory. It'll go to citrus, it'll go to other fruit trees. Um, all the Arctocarpus species, and once it gets really bad on a property, you know, I had a consultation with, I'm sure you guys, some of you guys know Tony from Iron World Farms, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and we had him come over and a USDA guy come over to this property in KL that was really, really bad. And next them to the picker, which has a cutter and a basket, and actually a little net so you can it, it just, just rolls, rolls right down to you. You don't have to try and just catch it from 50 feet up. Um, and so, yeah, having something that you know is really simple but effective to help you harvest is a benefit when you're when you're doing food, especially if you're harvesting a lot because you're, it's up there. They can be huge. It can be a really big strain. Yeah, use like a long pole, the snipper, and a gripper. Snipper gripper. The snipper oh, gripper. perfect. Yeah. And these guys. But yeah, to have the thing just be able to roll down instead of trying to... Yeah, you can, get, you can carry a basket with you and put the thing right into the basket. Yeah, I put it in a basket. You're good to go. Throw it in the truck. Yeah. Um, it's space out of the head. Our issue with harvesting is that a lot of the trees that really produce are back there in that forest, and they're just so tall. Yeah. They're like seven to eight feet in pounds. They're not for production, you know, harvest. No, nope. you're just like, oh, the terrain is up. <laughs> the terrain is up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a forest. We, 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 we,
And they grew straight. Yeah, they're, 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 they're in 70 it's, feet again. It's tight. <laughs> yeah. There's a Mo'olelo about um, that mentions Gulu branches being a gateway to the spirit world because of how many people have taken that one extra step to try to get. <laughs> uh, so yeah. they say the branches are a representation of, you know. Curious. Yeah. Careful, Sean. We can't. Uh, we can't yeah, lose I mean, you. They're, they're pruned right. They're really fun trees to climb. True, but I mean, yeah, those wild jungle trees, man. If you're <laughs> 50 feet so up and you're trying to get that one for your and family, and you're like, just one more step, and you get everybody dinner. So many times I'll be reaching. Close. Dangerous game, man. Super dangerous. Game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're finally at when to harvest, um, and we've got an entire. A guide on our website that really goes into detail um, but this is kind of the general cycle of flowering and ripening so this is generally where we recommend folks to harvest for us for commercial production um, this is going to be what's called um, mature to mature ripening. so that means all the starch has developed it hasn't started converting into sugars yet it's still really hard really firm which means that we can take it back and either process it into flour, make our pre-steamed blue chunks, um, make our mousse, do other things like that. Um, my favorite is probably like right here. Probably, uh, like when you, when you crack it open and it smells a little fermented and alcoholic, and you're like, it's probably, you know, that's my favorite. That's, you know, peak ulu for me. Um, you eat it raw or you make pancakes? I, I like to eat it raw. I like to make pancakes. Um, I like to make like um, little like patties. Yeah, little patties with other veggies and cheese, like ulu and cheese. Has got to be my favorite thing. Yeah, like cheese, like any kind of dish with ulu and cheese. Yeah. Roasted ulu with okay. coconut milk is my favorite. There you go. Okay. Have you guys had fire roasted before? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Fire roasted. Yeah. Yeah. That's my jam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super oh, ripe one, campfire style with like coconut milk and sea salt. Yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> That's bomb bomb. Um, I wonder if I have another slide on this or if it's going to oh. yes. So a little bit more on maturity stages. Um, it's really dependent on variety, like I said earlier, but you can kind of see um, initially the cells are really raised, really bumpy, really pokey, and it goes to being uh, more flat and the indentations in between become a little bit more clear. Um, so generally when you start to see darkening, when you start to see sap um, showing from the top stem, that's when it's really, really ripe. But we recommend farmers to harvest here for longest shelf life and for us to be able to take the most things out of it. And we've got a cool video on this online as well. We've got videos for everything. Everything I'm talking about, we have a video online. Uh, yeah, on ulu.coop. Yeah. So funny. Immature. It's small and immature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> never thought of it like that. Um, yes, and I think, is this uh, variety dependent? Yes. So this kind of shows you a little bit of the differences in varietal um, flowering and harvesting. So uh, what is this? Ma'afala and Fiti kind of follow the same pattern because um, their genetics are a little more similar. And then... Hawaiian has a little bit more of a sharp dip and a little bit more of a plateau later into the season. Uh, best harvesting, I mean, it's really simple. Clip it, let the sap drain. Um, we recommend folks for the co-op to cool their ulu if they can. Um, that's for us for our commercial production because we want the shelf life to be as long as it possibly can. But if you're harvesting them at home, it's also a good idea, too, if you don't plan to use them all in the next 12 hours. Bring a bucket of water, um, ice water, if possible, with you into the field and talk, chuck them in there for like an hour, and then put it straight in the fridge. It'll last a lot longer. Um, the super ripe ones don't do super great in the water, so I usually skip that step. <laughs> just do those. Yeah, just, yeah. Just, I mean, those aren't going to last anyways. Um, and then yeah, the grading and pricing. Um, we, we have two different standards. We have A grade fruit and B grade fruit. And that is based on uh, size and maturity. So if it's underripe, if you harvested it a little too early or a little too late, that'll be a B grade. And if it's smaller than 
five inches in diameter or length, uh, that's going to be a B grade fruit too. And that's, you know, just something we have to do for processing. There's more waste on smaller fruit, etc., um, etc. Et uh, I think this one is updated. Yeah, we currently pay $1.25 a pound to members and $0.75 cents a pound to non-members for grade A fruit and $0.75 cents a pound and $0.50 cents a pound for grade B fruit. Um, we just increased that for the first time a few months ago uh, from $1 a dollar pound to $1.25 a pound for members just to try to keep up with inflation and you know we haven't made a change to the price since we first uh, we found it. So trying to keep up with that. We are not at the point where as an organization we're profitable. So the ultimate goal is to become profitable and then our members share dividends based on how much fruit they deliver to us throughout the year. So that's kind of how the cooperative structure is based is, you know, we're there for support, we're there for keeping the market open, and our prerogative as staff members is to try to be as efficient as possible, try to, you know, get the farmers the most dollar per pound as we can, and uh, once we start doing that better and on a larger scale, we'll be able to give people paybacks, which is really, really cool, because then they get the money when they deliver the fruit, and then at the end of the financial year, uh, based on how much they contributed, they'll get a check. Um, and I think that that, you know, makes it so much more sustainable because you can buy your next round of fertilizer or you can buy a harvesting tool or you can pay for somebody to, you know, maintain your trees for you, which making sure that farmers have that extra feedback is, is really important. The focus is the people that we're serving, but we are a profit-sharing company. You know, the focus is to, to take that money and bring it back to our farmers and make sure that they're being reinvigorated by the success of the organization. And we're not there yet, but I'm really excited for when we are, because I think it's going to be a really cool example of what's possible here in Hawaii. You know, we, we have these very defined borders on our island, and if we work within those to, to work together and, you know, make things vertically integrated um, based on you know, common goals and common structures, I think that 